Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, January the 12th, 2015, and here are our top stories. Tonight, the Paris shooter's ties to the underwear bomber. Then, New York cops refuse to issue petty tickets. And who's behind the U.S. command attack? That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Why do the ISIS jackasses have Twitter accounts? Oh, because the Pentagon wants to be able to track what they're doing. Yeah, right. Well, as we've been saying all along, it looks like 2015 is going to be the year of internet control, of trying to justify the surveillance state. They've been pushing for this, of course, with the Sony hack, but there's been many different instances. It's a multi-pronged attack. They want to use the FCC to come after the internet to assert control, regulation, taxation. They also want to establish intelligence sharing, which essentially will pretend that your information that you share with the corporation belongs equally to them as well as to you. So the corporation can turn it over to the government and they can do it without any liability because they'll get that liability protection from the government. Now, the newly minted head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Senator Burr from North Carolina, can hardly contain his glee to justify the surveillance state. Check this out. Our intelligence folks, I can assure you, are scrubbing everything we can find. Now, he says they're going to go back and look at the connections between these guys. And it is really kind of interesting. It's almost like some kind of a Dickens novel where all the characters are interrelated, as you find out. And we see that happening right now. We see that, speaking with CNN, a freelance journalist said that the underwear bomber lived at the same apartment as shooting suspect Saeed Kouachi prior to his failed airline bombing attempt in December of 2009. Now, at the end of the news tonight, we're going to play a special report, a flashback to the full expose of how the underwear bomber was a perfect false flag attack orchestrated by the government with a solution in hand that they presented the very next day, machines that had been built a long time before that ready to roll out as this attack came out. I believe the same thing is happening here. I think that if you've got shooters and you know where they are, you know who they are, and you fail to stop them, yet you drop breadcrumbs that make it look like you instantly solve the crime, that is something that is being used to push this narrative that we need more of a surveillance state, that in spite of their failures, we need to double down, spend more money, spend more of our liberty in the vain attempt to try to get a secure state. The New York Daily News points out that the terrorist, Kulibaly, who was the shooter in the uh, incident with the kosher deli, had met with former French President Nicolas Sarkozy in 2009, years before this murder spree. And he said he even had a publicity stunt. If you look down at the bottom of that article to pull that up, he says, I don't know what I'm going to say to him. He was 27 at the time. But he said, I'll start by saying hello. So this is someone who's not only had a long criminal record, but the day before the meeting, he even is interviewed by a Parisian newspaper. He says, it's going to be a real encounter. It's impressive. Whether you like him or not, he's still the president. Yes, he's the president. And why wasn't there a security detail to stop him from meeting with the president, considering the fact they already had him on their list as being radicalized? He had a long criminal list. When Jay Leno interviewed Obama. He said the day before Obama came to the program, they showed up and they had a staff meeting and the Secret Service came in and pointed to various people in the room and said, don't show up tomorrow, you don't show up tomorrow, you don't show up tomorrow. If they know what the person's background is, if they're doing due diligence, then that's exactly what they're going to do. Did they not know this guy's information or is he maybe working for them? The Newsweek report says that a French gunman met Sarkozy in a crazy security blunder. And that's the question. Was it absolutely crazy, as they say? So consider the timeline. In 2002, this man is arrested for armed robbery. In 2005, 2006, he becomes friends with one of the two brothers, Sharif. They list him as becoming radicalized at that point. Then he meets with Sarkozy in 2009. Nothing suspicious in his background. They don't do a check, even though he's giving interviews to the Parisian newspaper the day before, they don't check. Then 10 months later, after he meets with Sarkozy, he is then busted. Police find weapons cash in his room, along with pictures uh, of Islamic uh, leaders. One of the fellows was planning an attack on the U.S. Embassy in Paris. Still, nothing happens to him. Then in 2013, he's given a sentence for planning a prison break yet he served no jail time then either. So the question is, are they giving this guy a pass out of pure incompetence? Are they giving him a pass because they're using him, because he's a double agent somehow? 
Are they giving him a pass because they want him to do something and they're laying back until the right time? Whether they are actually controlling these guys directly or whether or not they're letting them do this and then using it for their own political agenda, it's still a false flag. As Alex Jones pointed out yesterday, if you shake up a bag of Black Widow spiders, get them very angry, pour them in somebody's bed, you're not controlling those spiders anymore, but you pretty well know what they're going to do. But it gets even more suspicious. Look at this uh, story that was on Infowars.com today. Police chief investigating Charlie Hebdo attack reportedly commits suicide. Now, the interesting thing is, is that this fellow who committed suicide with his own revolver in his office, he is the second in command. The third in command, almost a year ago, a little over a year ago, did exactly the same thing in Limoges. That's uh, about three and a half hours outside of Paris. He was there interviewing family members of people who had been killed. Was it a coincidence or is that something that just adds more suspicion to it? Now, there's also an article where a French columnist writes for, uh, writing for Voltaire Network asks what's really behind this. He says, who did order this? Was this something that was ordered by Enwar Alaki, as they point out, or is this something that was ordered by someone else, some Western government or intelligence agency with another agenda? He points out that the mission of the commandos had no connection with jihadist technology. He said if they had been on a jihad, they would have destroyed first the archives of the newspaper on site after the model of their actions in North Africa and Levant. For jihadists, the first duty is to destroy the objects that they believe offend God and to punish the enemies of God. And he says, similarly, they would not have immediately retreated, running from the police without completing their mission. They would have rather have completed their mission and died on the spot than to leave those cartoons there. He said, also, they wielded their weapons as expertly and fired advisedly. They were not dressed in the fashion of jihadists, but as military commandos. His belief is that this is a clash of civilizations, as he points out, designed by Tel Aviv and Washington, certainly by Western governments. It looks like this is something that suits their agenda that they've been working on for a very long time. But of course, they're trying to say that they're going to take the brave high ground and they're going to defend freedom of speech. Really? Was that what happened in the marches? Was that a march of political unity? Or were there political recriminations taken against their political opponents? Look at this story. Socialist Hollanda bans right-wing Nationalist Party and challenger Le Pen from the Unity March. This is from the Gateway Pundit. They point out that Hollanda banned the National Front Party leader Marine Le Pen from the Unity Rally in Paris on Sunday. The French Nationalist Party, who wants to clamp down on immigration and won the elections last May, was banned from this march. Le Pen was furious that the party who came out on top of the European elections last May was excluded from the march. So there's definitely a political aspect even to that. They're not there for free speech. And certainly the whole idea that they're standing strong for free speech really comes down with an article that Paul Joseph Watson pointed out in his video earlier today, going back to January of 2009, because the previous French prime minister, Sarkozy, came after a Charlie Hebdo journalist who mocked his son. This was a French cartoonist who was put on trial for charges of anti-Semitism over a Sarkozy job. And again, remember that Charlie Hebdo had pointed out they'd been sued 13 times by the Roman Catholic Church, only once they said by the Muslims, but if you criticize someone who is Jewish, you not only get charged criminally for anti-Semitism, but Charlie Hebdo fired the cartoonist. What was in this cartoon? Of course, this was an 80-year-old cartoonist who had worked for them for quite some time. He faced charges of, quote, inciting racial hatred for a column that he wrote in the satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo. It ended with him being fired from the magazine. So what was in that cartoon? Well, it was about the engagement of the former Prime Minister Sarkozy's son, who was then 22 years old, to a Jewish heiress of an electronics goods chain. Commenting on the unfounded rumor that the president's son was planning to convert to Judaism, the cartoonist wrote, he'll go a long way in life, that little lad. So that's what he said that qualified for charges of anti-Semitism. Charlie Hebdo, who say that they always support the absolute right of free speech, called on him to resign for that, to which he said, I would rather castrate myself. Well, it turns out that Obama would rather castrate the Internet than to let us have the kinds of freedoms that allow some of these things to happen. Today, he was talking about how he was going to do that, and simultaneously, for some reason, sitcom's social media got hacked, a very serious crime. Leanne McAdoo has the details. 
attackers claiming to be aligned with Islamic State militants took control of the U.S. Central Command's Twitter and YouTube accounts just after noon today. The background and profile photos of the CENTCOM accounts were both changed to show an apparent militant and the phrases cyber caliphate and I love you ISIS. The hackers have threatened U.S. soldiers saying watch your backs. They posted emails and phone numbers of top military officers, threatened the release of classified documents, including some slides showing the China scenario. In a statement, the Central Command confirmed that its Twitter account had been compromised and said it is taking appropriate measures to address the matter. Forget cyber laws. This is the countdown to an internet kill switch. The group conveniently took over Central Command's accounts just as the president was delivering a speech on new cybersecurity proposals this afternoon. In recent days, experts have been warning about a coming cyber Pearl Harbor. And in an interview for PBS, Edward Snowden discussed how the new military weapon is cyber weaponry. The NSA whistleblower revealed just how easily the United States could be compromised if hackers targeted core routers that connect virtually every industry in America. When it comes to cyber warfare, we have more to lose than any other nation on Earth. Now, when Sony was hacked, cybersecurity experts said that there was no way that North Korea could have done it, and it was more likely an inside job. The FBI, however, continues to assert that, according to its expertise, it was North Korea, period. Now, how do we know that CENTCOM hasn't hacked itself? Wouldn't that be the easiest way to enforce an Internet kill switch? This is the U.S. Central Command being hacked. Now, no doubt this latest hack will keep officials on high alert. The NYPD and FBI issued alerts today after ISIS re-released a video calling for attacks of intelligence officers, police officers, soldiers, and civilians in the U.S. Federal law enforcement agencies are taking the threats seriously. But it's not just ISIS using the momentum from last week's radical Islamic rampage in Paris to further their agenda. The West has wasted no time calling for CISPA-style legislation and information sharing, and you can expect to see this issue of cybersecurity propagated heavily in the president's upcoming State of the Union address. Now, of course, hacking their Twitter and YouTube accounts, that's something that is highly visible, but it's not something that is very damaging. And as the Washington Post points out, virtually all the posted documents appear to have already been publicly available online. There you go. Absolutely no damage. But the question is, why does Central Command have social media accounts? Well, the Washington Post gives us the answer to that as well. In case you don't know, they say the United States and the Islamic State have waged a propaganda battle online for the better part of a year after the militants rose to prominence and seized broad swaths of territory. Yes. It is all about a propaganda war. Do you think they would wage that propaganda war by hacking their own account? I mean, how hard is that? Do you think it might be an inside job like everyone told the FBI happened at uh, Sony with the interview? Of course, everybody believes that it was an inside job, but the FBI will not admit that. Anonymous tweeted today that its members had tracked the ISIS hacker to an IP address somewhere in Maryland. They say, FBI, you're welcome. They quipped in a tweet, we'll find you, cyber caliphate. (laughs) There you go. Now, we have a more detailed report from Mikhail Thalen and Joe Biggs. That's on Infowars.com. Who hacked the CENTCOM Twitter? You can check that out. Now, Aaron Schwartz had warned us, and of course, he was the one who pretty much led the defeat of CISPA the first time it came around. He warned us who was really behind all of these exploits. I think it's really important that we stop cyber attacks. And the way to do that is to make our cyber systems more secure, to close the vulnerabilities that allow attackers to get in. But the problem is the government's doing the opposite. They are funding the creation of vulnerabilities. They are offering rewards for people to find and build vulnerabilities in the system and give it to the U.S. government so then the U.S. government can launch cyber attacks in other countries. But, of course, Fox News is still trying to pretend that the U.S. government is not the instigator of these attacks, but the victim. Listen to this clip that Fox News had as they were just discussing the interview. We played this clip before, and they try to make the case that the government is the victim, even bringing up Stutznet, which we all know was created by the U.S. and Israeli governments. 
what happened at Sony was so destructive, it was like dropping a bomb on that corporation. All right, you said, and you were quoted saying that the talk about we don't want to be on the defensive. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it strikes me as a little bit odd because we have known about this risk for a very Correct. long time. Look, the seminal events in terms of cyber warfare happened at least three years ago. Stuxnet on Iran's nuclear facility that destroyed the centrifuges. Stay with us right after the break. We have some positive trends and some good news about the police. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Every year we make resolutions to lose weight and get in shape. And the truth is it's hard, even with diet and exercise, because of toxic food in our environment that is stressing our bodies more than ever before. Working with experts in nutrition and biochemistry, I found that super high quality nutraceuticals, in addition to my diet and exercise, were the answers that synergistically worked. I can see the drastic changes every day with the amount of weight I've lost, my increased stamina, and more of a twinkle in my eye. That's why we are now so excited to launch the InfoWars Life Resolution Pack, combining three essential formulations, oxygen-based cleanser Oxy Powder, the Secret 12 Bioavailable Vitamin B12, and your choice of super female or super male vitality. Now all available at a discounted price to you and your family to bring in the new year and make 2015 a true success. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 2015 is the year to do it, and it all starts at InfoWarsLife.com. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. Okay. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the ProPure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. It has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The ProPure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your ProPure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. Well, one of the incidents last year that really focused the public's attention on the excess use of police force was the shooting in the hills outside of Albuquerque of a homeless man who was camping out. Now, today we learned that Albuquerque cops who gunned that homeless camper down are facing murder charges. A New Mexico district attorney's office has filed murder charges against the Albuquerque police officers who gunned down the nonviolent camper last year. And this is interesting. The DA's office performed a rare but legal move and bypassing the grand jury to indict the officers reportedly marks the first time that an Albuquerque police officer has been charged after shooting someone in the line of duty. That's something that a lot of people have been calling for, the fact that they would stop and bypass the grand jury convictions. That's a point of reform that uh, people passed out on a flyer on New Year's Eve in New York City calling for that along with a lot of other reforms because we need to have an open process reviewing what happened when the police officers shoot down someone and there's a question as to whether or not there was a excessive use of force. That's a very positive development. There's also positive developments in New York City as well. We've reported in the past on how they have slowed down their work, uh, their workload, I guess, and you could call it that, in terms of giving people tickets for minor violations. That was down anywhere from 93 to 95%. Well, guess what? On New Year's Eve, it was down 100%. It went down to zero. The New York City police issued zero low-level crime tickets to the one million revelers in Times Square on New Year's Eve. This is reported by the Daily Mail. They say that there were no tickets for having an open container of alcohol in Times Square 
on New Year's Eve. They say the slowdown in enforcement has also not translated to a rise in crime. Could it be that the New York Police Department is kind of understanding that they're being used as pawns? They're being used by a mayor, by a city council, who tries to elevate themselves and take the high road when things hit the fan. They throw the cops under the bus, even though the cops are doing what they ask them to do, enforcing things that should not be a crime, going over the top in terms of the use of force and collecting those things, just as Eric Garner was choked to death for selling cigarettes without having the kind of uh, taxes and licenses that they had decreed. I think they are tired of that, and I think they're starting to understand where that game is going. And of course, that's a game that is being played at the national level, especially. That's where Obama and Eric Holder and the federal government are telling the police that they're operating in a war zone, that they need to take people out before they take them out. They're giving them military equipment and, of course, training from the Southern Poverty Law Center to identify who their enemies are. Then when something happens, something blows up, they take the high road, they distance themselves from these police officers that they put in this situation and leave them to take all the heat. Now, of course, it's costing the city $10 million a week. This is an article from the New York Post. They say there were 1,191 parking summonses handing, handed out between December 29th and January the 4th. That was down 93%. And they say, although they're losing 10 to $11 million a week, that's small change compared to their 77 billion dollar New York City budget. And if you work out that percentage, even if they were to take that for a year, he said that might start to really affect us. Even if you project it out over a year, though, that's still less than a half a percent of their budget total to not give people parking tickets, for example. And it's a lot of petty crimes like that is how the police are being used. Now, they're pushing back against the police at the same time. The city, as well as the upper level officers are threatening them, telling them they're not going to be allowed to take vacations and have leave until they start to make this up. This is a story from the New York Post. New York Police Department cops are told no vacations until the work slowdown ends. They say it is a slowdown showdown. And a quote from one union source said, police officers around the city are now threatened with transfers, with no vacation time, or sick time unless they write summonses. They say this is the same practice that caused officers to be labeled as racist and abusers of power. Everyone here is under orders, no time off during the summons catch-up blitz. In other words, are they going to go out and try to double the numbers that they've had since they've cut them down uh, by 93 to 100%? And they also point out the majority of new summonses they said written are not protecting the public in any way. That is what the police and the police unions are saying. So I think that's a very positive sign. Not only is this not having any effect on crime, crime is dropping even though they're not writing these tickets, the police themselves are fed up being strong-armed tax collectors of the general public. They don't like the fact that they've been put out here, exposed, used as pawns, and so they're pushing back against their supervisors there. Now, it's still not certain whether they're going to continue to do that, or whether they're going to return to their old ways. Nevertheless, the war on drugs is still with us, and this is still the heart of the corruption of law enforcement in America. Look at this article. Cops steal $18,000 from a man who broke no law because a drug dog alerted to the cash. This was a Tennessee man who had committed no crime. He was not even driving the car that was pulled over. He was a passenger in the car, and the car was pulled over, they say, because it changed lanes without using a blinker. They pull a police dog over and have him sniff the car. He doesn't find anything, but he alerts to the money. Now, pay attention to this. As we've pointed out many times, and as this article points out, it is widely known that a large percentage, up to 90% of U.S. paper money, contains traces of cocaine. Having a large amount of cash will always alert a drug dog. In fact, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit has ruled that government does not have probable cause to seize cash from motorers based only on drug detection dogs' reactions, stating specifically that the majority of money in circulation has drugs on it. And of course, no drugs were found in this particular case. And as this article points out, calling it uh, road piracy, this is from DC Clothesline, they say it's gotten so bad that the Canadian government warns its travelers about traveling to the United States, warning them that American police officers will steal things from them, cash, cars, never charging them with a crime, 
doing it under this program they call civil asset forfeiture. It is nothing but road pri piracy. And they point out that in the last year, there's been 62,000 incidents of this with two and a half billion dollars stolen from people on the street who have committed no crime for which they have no probable cause. Now stay with us right after the break. We've got a special report from Dan Bedondi. He confronts the new governor of Rhode Island. We'll be right back. 2015 is almost here, and with it comes those New Year's resolutions to finally transform your body the way you want it. There's a reason over 88% of New Year's resolutions fail. Make this year different by equipping yourself with Oxy Powder, the next level in cleansing the body naturally. Using Super Oxygenation, Oxy Powder, available through InfoWarsLife.com, gently cleanses the body while you sleep with easy capsules. Tens of thousands of individuals have used Oxy Powder to cleanse their bodies and aid in their transformations. Even InfoWars Nightly News Director Rob Dew has been using Oxy Powder with incredible success. I took it that first day, and then I took it for six more days after that. 12 pounds melted off in about a week. I'd say a week, seven days. 2015 can be different. Diet and exercise are important, but a lot of us have already tried that. Oxy Powder flushes it out. Secure your Oxy Powder at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. Sold out for weeks due to the difficult and extensive proprietary process behind its creation, the exclusive InfoWars Life Secret 12 formulation is now back in stock in the last limited shipment of 2014, the most bioactive form that has been created with our proprietary process. This ultra-clean vitamin B12 nutraceutical has been carefully crafted and developed over the last two years and is based on cellular science of how your body actively absorbs essential nutrients. Secret 12 is taken by mouth, right on the tongue, and then swallowed. No needles, no injections. Vitamin B12 deficiency is linked to scores of serious problems. And Secret 12 is a fusion of two organic proprietary forms of vitamin B12, bringing you a true nutraceutical quality vitamin B12, Secret 12. Secret 12 is an excellent Christmas gift and is tailor-made to boost your New Year's resolutions. Supplies of Secret 12 are very limited. Secure yours today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Dan Bedondi reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. On this podium right behind me, the state of Rhode Island is about to crown its first ever female governor, Gina Raimondo, who also happens to be the state's general treasurer. She has lost $372 million out of the pension fund. She's a member of the communist group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. She's also a gun grabber. She was backed by both Obamas and both Clintons and had endorsements from the Pope. So it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what kind of tyranny unfolds in the state of Rhode Island within the next four years. Hi ma'am, how are you? I'm well, thank you, how are you? Great, and are you here to support Gina Raimondo? Uh, yes, I am, yes I am. I am. She's a wonderful person and I think she's gonna do a very, very good job. Absolutely. Okay, and are you support her gun control policy? Uh, the gun control policy, well, um, I'll have to pass on that one, you know what I mean, as far as that goes, you know, her policy on that. Uh, well, you know, I'd have to really take a look at them. She's sterner with the gun, gun control, which is a positive. I think that gun control really needs to, really needs a fresh look at the amendment and uh, how it affects society and how it's a kind of a breach of our civil liberties to support it in the wrong way. I think it's good, yeah. We need to get more guns off the street, definitely. Do you know who the CFR is? I do not. The Council on Foreign Relations, it was a communist group backed by David Rockefeller? Um, no, no I'm not. It's a communist organization by David Rockefeller and uh, Gina Raimondo is a registered member? N nope, never, never heard of it and uh, like I said, I'm not really here for politics. I didn't know that, no I didn't know that, but I, you know, I have no comment on yeah. it. I, I know her since she started running and I think she's on the right path and going to do very good. Okay. Uh, am I aware that there are communist organizations? Well, of course there are. Okay, Macarthyism is a long time off from here, isn't it? Uh, you were also aware that, uh, about the $372 million missing out of the pension fund. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Is that a, just a scandal? Uh, I think I, I want to uh, end this. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Now we're going to have to give up a little of our own narrow self-interest and give something back to our community. 
but that's how America works. Hey, Governor, could you tell us your your involvement in the CFR, please? Mrs. Raimondo. Mrs. Raimondo. Could you tell us your involvement? Hi, Governor, what's your involvement with the CFR? Hi, we're going to go down this way. Do you know it's a communist organization? Governor, what's your involvement with the Council on Foreign Relations? The public wants to know. We just want to answer them. So you support communism right here in the state of Rhode Island. See, the governor refuses to answer the question. They got two Gestapo cops over here blocking my way with their classic one-on-one -on -one psychology skills here. You gentlemen familiar who the CFR is? The Council on Foreign Relations, it's a communist organization started by David Rockefeller. Gina Raimondo is a registered member, sir. See, so Gina Raimondo's campaign manager. Are you a member of the CFR like Gina? Mr. Hayes, how does it feel to support a communist? How does it feel to support a communist? Very good, Steve. No, I'm just asking questions. So why are you going to be into the questions? Sir? Huh? Who said? Huh? Oh, yeah, well, it's the... Why don't you stay right here, okay? No, it's the First Amendment. He's been on my team since day one. I understand that, but just not in there. I have a right to be in there. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. It's called the First Amendment. It's the First Amendment in the Constitution. I, I got you. But I've been told, you know, it's a lot of people in there, so... So the staff told you right now. Just keep According it. to this officer here, the staff of the governor said I can't go into the room. So uh, press is denied access. Sir, who's in charge? Of security? No, I mean, I know they told you to give you an order from the Lamina, but who's in charge? Because that's, that's a viol I'm part of the press and it's a violation of the First Amendment. Regardless of what Eric Hayer says, he's not the boss. Who can I talk to? Who's in charge here? So do you can just get in line and go right through the receiving line like everybody else? No, I mean no that problem, okay? Well, that's it for tonight's news. If you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe there for free. If you're not a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, please become a subscriber and help to support our operation here. Of course, you can share that with up to 20 people each night, Monday through Friday. And you can also share all of Alex Jones's documentaries. And speaking of documentaries, we have a flashback report tonight of what happened with the underwear bomber. Of course, it was a false flag attack with these connections between this new shooter, the underwear bomber, all of them connected to Alaki. It's time for you to take a look at this flashback report. So stay with us right after the news. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the ProPure G2.0 filtration system. High quality H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. Yeah, it has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. The ProPure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your ProPure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. And we now know that the three shooters were being handled by the known 
double, triple agent of al-Qaeda working for some of the crooks at the Pentagon, Anwar al-Awlaki. And that is now in mainstream news and that one of the shooters from the Paris attacks lived with Mutalib, the biggest patsy in the known universe. Drugged, put on the flight with no ID, no visa, passport. Came out in congressional testimony that an unnamed U.S. agency pressured the Dutch to get him on the plane in Amsterdam in its flight bound into Detroit, Michigan. We, of course, broke that first with the lawyers that were witnesses to it, the husband and wife lawyers. We had Kurt Haskell on the broadcast. And then months later on C-SPAN, we have that clip coming up. It was confirmed. Well, he saw the sharp breaths man arguing when Matalab didn't have IDs and getting him on the plane. Suspected parachuter lived with underwear bomber in Yemen. The underwear bombing was completely staged. We'll prove it when we come back. Now we know what happened. They were definitely protected by the West and they were allowed to train in an area given to them by NATO and by Turkey. So up the chain, up river, the West created this terror group. Let's start with uh, the airport adventures, which they now admit are going nationwide with the Viper teams at bus stops, train stops, the streets, shopping malls, random vans, sending you through body scanners, biometrically scanning 360, your naked body. Now I've seen more in-depth images by the actual companies where they can zoom in on pores. Okay, so they're showing you a low-res image, but totally naked. Your family, it's child porn. They don't care. Uh, now, if you take a picture of your two-year-old daughter in diapers, and this, this made ABC News and CNN, the children's bottoms weren't even seen, but because the children were had towels around them hugging. That was a three-year-old and two-year-old. They were arrested. Their children were taken. So that's th things that aren't bad are called bad. But then the government recording your naked wife, you, your children, and now they're going in at all major airports, 214, and their uh, people in Houston are being forced through them. But people are refusing and saying, no, you perverts, you're not going to do that. So Aaron Dykes and Rob Dew back from six days of adventure uh, with uh, the police state in Canada and the U.S. Uh, tell us what happened. Well, I got hit up first. This was in uh, D.C. flying to Detroit. Because you got long hair. You get pulled right. out every time. Some <laughs> like, kind of al Qaeda. But uh, what I, Aaron was already through um, security, and I walked through, and they go, oh, sir, can you step in here? And I said, uh, so what's that? And they said, oh, this is our RFID scanner. And I said, no, I'm not going in there. And uh, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not going in there. I don't. I said, I don't agree with that. And they said, oh, well, it's voluntary. I said, well, good, I'm not doing it. Yeah, but so that's like SeaWorld made you oh, thumbprint right. at first. It was voluntary. Now it's mandatory. It's like dog training. Passengers describe a terror attack and the arrest of a suspect who tried to blow up a plane as it landed at Metro Airport. We heard a loud pop then a bit of a smoke. Sounded first like a balloon being popped. All of a sudden heard some screams and flight attendants ran up and down the, the aisles and... Everything's crazy, people are screaming, there's fire on the plane. So there was a lady shouting back and she was saying uh, things like, uh, what are you doing, what are you doing? Um, and uh, at that moment, I was sure I was going to die. And we're learning tonight more about the suspect. Let's get to Fox News' Andrea Isom. She begins our team coverage. She is live at Metropolitan Airport. Andrea? As the hours go on, you are right. We are learning more about the suspect, and quite frankly, the details are chilling. The man, the menace, 23-year-old Abdul Mudala of Nigeria. Mudala's despicable actions were all on al-Qaeda's behalf. Sources telling Fox News his instructions were to blow up the plane over U.S. soil. The intelligence community knew about Umar Farouk Abdulmutallab weeks ago and failed to spread word that would have put him on the no-fly list. The father of the suspect in the Christmas incident warned U.S. officials in Africa about his son's extremist views. That a report was prepared and it was sent on to the CIA in Langley, Virginia, CIA headquarters, but it was not disseminated to the wider intelligence community. Obviously, when you have a father coming in and talking to the embassy about a son who's radicalized, gives the embassy the passport number, the first thing you would think is a, a very fast effort to see if the person's got a visa and suspend the visa. 
But one of the things you don't know about is the number of people that we have turned away because their name has been on the watch list uh, or on the no-fly list. Only my mom could, but not me and my dad, because both me and my dad are, are on the watch list. Tough to believe, but eight years later, we are still talking about connecting the dots at a failure to communicate. Call for immediate reviews on how this guy got on the plane and how he was able to get some explosives on the plane. So we got a world to go. Uh, this is a, uh, a controlled patsy. Facts are facts. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. And we have this, uh, this same pattern that we've seen again and again. We have these individuals that have very limited mental equipment, but nevertheless, they're able to work miracles. In other words, they can do things that a normal person would never be able to do. You'd be arrested, you'd be questioned, you'd be searched, you'd be stopped in some way. He gets out of countries, he's disheveled, looks like he's drugged, <laughs> stumbling around. I mean, this is classic. He doesn't, he doesn't get on any serious uh, list of, uh, for scrutiny or, or special search. And then we have this famous story of the well-dressed Indian who accompanies him. I saw two men and they caught my eye because they seemed to be an odd pair. One was uh, what I would describe as a poor looking black teenager around 16 or 17. And the other, the other man, a, a age 50-ish uh, wealthy looking Indian man. And I was just wondering why they were together kind of strange and I watched them approach what I would call the, the ticket agent, the final person that checks your boarding pass before you get on the plane. He gets from one plane to another thanks to this Patsy Minder, a Patsy Chaperone or Patsy Monitor. The only person that spoke was the Indian man and what he said was uh, this man needs to board the plane but he doesn't have a passport and the ticket agent responded well if he doesn't have a passport you can't get on the plane to which the Indian man responded back, uh, he's from Sudan, we do this all the time. And the ticket agent said, well then you'll have to go and talk to my manager. And she directed them down a hallway. Uh, and, and that was the last time that I saw the Indian man mm -hmm. and the black man I didn't see again until he tried to blow up our plane. Then I'd be interested to see, is there a passport? Won't the FBI please show us a passport if there is one. They won't release the videos from Amsterdam. I mean, this is suspicious. Oh yes, I think it's beyond suspicious. It's a clear case of a patsy. So he's a controlled asset. And of course, it's not a matter of failure to connect the dots. We're hearing all about the unconnected dots. No, this is the desired outcome. Let me just point out a couple of other things here. Uh, we're told that uh, the, uh, the this uh, alleged uh, bomber, right? The knicker bomber, whatever they call him, uh, he was in contact with this character Aulaki in Yemen, and of course, he, this Aulaki, I call him Aulaki the CIA lackey. Aulaki the lackey, and remember, he's a CIA lackey. He's a double agent, a triple agent, if you want. He is used uh, as a kind of beacon to recruit patsies across the world, and they can always sheep dip somebody like Major Hassan if they want to say, you're linked to Al-Qaeda, they just have you exchange a few emails with this Aulaki, and that's what he's good for, right? He goes back to 9-11 and Hani Hanjour. So this, this guy, is uh, he's, he's, a, he's a U.S. agent under whatever layers of, of garb that he's got. The other thing is, how was this uh, young uh, patsy, uh, Omar Farouk Mutalab, how was he radicalized? And I think we're getting some pretty good indications that it's this Brixton Mosque, Finsbury Mosque, Access in London, the school for patsies, the, the British patsies. Which, patsy. by the way, six months ago, I remember it, you predicted we'd see plane bombings out of that mosque. It, this is not so hard to do. Remember Richard Reed, Richard Reed, mentally retarded vagrant who was sleeping on the floor of Brixton Mosque, I think. He was given the same PETN uh, explosive by somebody, so that's what this, this uh, Omar Farouk was given then, allegedly, once again, in in Yemen. So you can see it, it all it fits together and it, it all comes from these same 
these same places. There are reports today that the Christmas Day body bomber met with an American-born radical cleric, Anwar al-Awlaki. He's believed to be living in Yemen, al-Awlaki is. He's not only been linked to al-Qaeda in the past, but he reportedly exchanged emails with the suspected Fort Hood shooter, Nadal Hassan, before that shooting massacre in Texas. I would also point out that the security company at Schiphol Airport is ICTS, which is a uh, Israeli-owned firm. They were the same firm that allowed Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, to board the flight, the American Airlines flight to Miami. Same, uh, uh, same uh, uh, explosive uh, material was found in his shoes as was found in Mr. Mutalib's underwear. They ignored the threats on purpose. Obviously, this, uh, w you know, we had a lot of people sitting at home over the Christmas holidays. Families gathered around a television set. Uh, the, another terror attack. Huge problems for travel now. When we talk about screenings at the airport and, and other protective mechanisms along the way, w what should we be doing that clearly we're not? The scanning machines that we currently are beginning to deploy in the U.S. that would give us the ability to see what someone has concealed underneath their clothing. These body scanners are the key with like, uh, you know, these different psychological syndromes where people serve the abuser. Yeah, because uh, that's what you have to get in as to where this is going. It's not fun. It's degradation. It's the dehumanization of the individual. So really, what they're telling you is not only do you not own, own your body, you own nothing. You don't even own the patterns to your own genes. They're telling you you're a piece of property. What do they do when you first come into a prison? They strip you and do a medical exam to humiliate you. They hose you down in front of the other prisoners and they laugh at you, make jokes about you. When Aaron went through, it was even worse because I was behind him. Yeah, I went through. He told me to go through the scanner and I said no. He said, why aren't you going to do it? I said, it violates my privacy. And, and this is what happened. This guy got scared. This guy was <gasps> bigger than me. He was athletic. Ooh. He started shaking when I said no. You think it doesn't matter to well, Because it's no. a delusional world. He thought he'd found a real terrorist. Yeah. He was shaking, visibly shaking, when I said no. And he tried to trick me to go through it again and told me they were going to body wand me, which they ended up doing. And then he tells me, oh, because I don't like it, because it violates my Fourth Amendment, I read too much. Oh, you're one of those who reads too much. And you said he put his hands on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he grabbed when I said no, like he started shaking. He didn't know what to do. And then his first flinch reaction was to grab my arm and try to pull me through the scanner. It was absolutely crazy. And you got women apologizing to the agents. I'm so sorry. I forgot my mascara and my lipstick. And the Fourth Amendment says if you're going to search, you're not only going to have a warrant, you're going to say specifically what you're looking for. But, but, but it's not specific. It's liquids. It's lipstick. It could be shoes. It could be breaking the will of the people. The real purpose of body scanners. And you scroll down, it shows the Nazis and others strip searching women in World War II. I tell you what I would do personally. I would just take uh, photographs of all the mass graves of World War II and the Soviet Union, of all the naked bodies, and have big placards of that. And Genius! Saying, and saying, we're not going to end up like this. No, thank you. Great idea, pointing out that they always strip you down before they kill you. I mean, it's a real act of submission. Do you agree with me that this telling ev everyone you will be naked body scanned is a key point in our conditioning and we must resist it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's an ongoing process of the uh, personalization, dehumanization, and getting the public to accept the fact that they're nothing but cattle. Once you're on the plane, you're coming into Detroit, what happens next? The pilot comes on, the speaker, and he says we have 10 minutes to landing. Flight crew, take your seats and buckle up. A, uh, a flight attendant walks by my seat mumbling to herself, something smells like smoke. I looked up, I'm in row 27. Uh, I could see smoke coming from row 19, eight rows up. Uh, it looked, it wasn't a lot of smoke at that time. and It looked like it was coming from the floor. So I, uh, I unbuckled my seatbelt, took a few steps up the aisle to get a better look. And, uh, and then it burst into flames across the floor of the seats and up the wall to the ceiling. When it burst into flames, people were screaming, fire, fire. Uh, terrorists, water, 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 we need water, somebody get water. Uh, flight attendants were screaming. The pilot comes on the intercom and says emergency landing and starts speeding up. And while this is going on, the, the terrorist man's being hauled off into the first class area by a couple passengers. We are five days into this and we've not seen any surveillance footage. The media doesn't seem concerned about 
uh, eye eyewitnesses seeing a man videotaping the whole flight aimed at this guy. When we first took off, I noticed about 10 seats ahead of us to the left-hand side. He uh, had a camcorder, and I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe this was his first flight and was just excited. And then when the actual incident occurred, I looked up, and he was the only one standing and filming the entire thing. That's obvious an accomplice or a handler or something. Uh, we've got this other guy getting him through security. I mean, any other comments? When we were being detained in Detroit, we were held uh, in an area of a, of a baggage claim area that all the passengers from our flight, there was nobody uh, except for some law enforcement personnel. After we had been there for about an hour, all the time with our carry-on bags, three bomb-sniffing dogs were brought in. One of them sat down by the bag that was brought in by a the man in orange. He had an orange. He appeared to be of Indian or Pakistani or some similar descent, maybe around age 30. He was walked back to a room, not in handcuffs. Uh, he went in the door. He was in there approximately an hour. When he came out, he was handcuffed, taken away. A, an FBI officer came up to the group of the rest of us passengers and said the following, which is not exact, but close. You're being moved to another area. It's not safe here. I'm sure all of you saw what just happened and can figure out why you're being moved. We were taken to a customs area and uh, they brought bomb dogs and uh, checked all the luggage with that. Uh, another person was taken aside and handcuffed and brought out uh, and we were moved into another room for safety reasons, they told us. My story on this has been the same all along and uh, the FBI now has five versions of their story, which I clearly lay out with the time period and with each version, and they're just not, they're not credible. There is absolutely no excuse for the reason why, number one, we're left on the plane for 20 minutes, not knowing if there is another bomb there. Number two, security allowing us to take our carry-on bags off the plane, and we stood there with all of our bags together, for an hour until the bomb sniffing dogs arrived. Uh, and then, you know, after they found one, well, then we're moved to another area. And now they don't want to talk about the man who was taken away. You were there. They didn't stop him for immigration violations. The dog went over and sat down in front of his bag, the alert right. for explosives. Right. Exactly. Unless this is a passport sniffing dog. Uh, this is a huge story, one of the biggest out there. The FBI is on this full time. They know what's going on. Why are they being dishonest? And, and, and how do we investigate this when the investigators themselves are engaged in clear obstruction of the truth? You know, I don't know how else to take it. It's either utter incompetence or intentionally hiding something, you know, and I don't know how to take it. And still, we're now, what, eight, nine days into this and we still haven't seen the Amsterdam footage. Well, and also, why aren't we seeing the video of when he's going through uh, metal detector, passport check, you know, and boarding? You know, this is a modern airport. You'd think they would have video of all this of some sort. They didn't say, oh, we'll look at that. They just said, no, there was no one helping him, which is very suspicious instead of just putting the footage out. If somebody robs a bank or holds up a gas station, well, there's video footage of the, the incident on the 11 o'clock news, usually that very night. If I'm not correct, well, show the video. What are you hiding? Well, now, Sunday, it came out, what, five days ago, six days ago, authorities were watching different Nigerian on Christmas Day flights, CNN. What a way to take a huge issue and just kind of put it out there like it's milk toast. Okay, there was somebody else. Yeah, they did arrest him, but we're not going to talk about it. Kurt, there's a definite cover-up, and you've been vindicated in triplicate. Not only that, but I don't know if you caught the ABC News article that came out over the weekend. Uh, there were a couple sentences knock in the bottom of this article about female suicide bombers. I don't know if you caught this. No, no, tell us. I'll read it to you word for word. Federal agents also tell ABC News they're attempting to identify a man who passenger said helped Abdul Mutalab change planes for Detroit when he landed in Amsterdam from Lagos, Nigeria. Authorities had initially discounted the passenger accounts 
but the agents say there is a growing belief the man may have played a role to make sure Abdul Mutalab did not get cold feet. Oh my God, you've been vindicated by them on that. But obviously they, they think the trail's cold now. They have all the surveillance footage. They were involved in a cover-up. Kurt, this is huge. Well, that that was my take on it, but unfortunately for ABC News, they buried it in the bottom of a seemingly unrelated article about female suicide bombers heading here from Yemen. Why is this not front page news everywhere, number one? Number two, why are you burying it at the bottom of this article? Number three, why did you initially discount my story to begin with? It's not like I'm not credible here. And of course, they had COINTELPRO posing as the Patriot Movement attacking you. Uh, all the usual suspects. I mean, it never ends, Kurt. We are, of course, going to get into the top story today. In plain view, as if it's no big deal, DetroitNews.com. Okay, it was a U.S. government agent. That was the smart dressed man that led Umar Farouk Alamatab, or the underwear bomber, on to the aircraft in Amsterdam. After a month plus of lying and saying that, that no such man existed and saying no one else was pulled off the plane in Detroit, supposedly with a bomb. Now they've admitted that happened as well. Kurt Haskell, the lawyer, and his lawyer wife. Uh, they've both on record have been proven right with other witnesses. And you add how they were already getting in Yemen. That's now confirmed Washington Post. They were planning to already launch a bigger attack, 2,000 troops there. And then right on time, right as the body scanners were scheduled to go in in January nationwide. That was already scheduled, folks. They're, they're saying on the news, oh, now we're doing this. So now I went and looked it up. They were scheduled to go in the additional 214 airports. They were in less than 20. And so although we have acquired these machines, they are not as widely deployed as they should be. In your current role as a consultant, do you have an interest in body scanners? I, you know, I, to be, we consult with all kinds of firms, including firms that do manufacture body scanners. You do have some some interest in uh, in, in, in more sales of body scanners. Uh. As well as a lot of other security measures. But I would point out that I've talked about this for probably the last three years. Read what the scanners do to your body. And the TSA guys, again, you need to know why you're going to be dying in five years of cancer. Go ahead. And then we find this uh, article about terahertz waves, which is what they use to do this scanner. Uh, this came in today. And... According to one of their studies, I'm just going to read this real quick. Terahertz waves are in the electromagnetic spectrum between microwaves and infrared. And uh, they pass through non-conductive materials such as clothes, paper, wood, and brick. They say the forces that are generated by these THZ fields are tiny and resonant effects that allow the THZ waves to unzip double-stranded DNA, creating bubbles in the strand that could significantly interfere with processes such as gene expression and DNA replication. So step in the microwave. And of course, the fools don't know that the reports you've pulled up and I've looked at, it, these things are leaking. But the TSA guys are going to love dying of cancer. Oh, yeah. This They're is fun. Surrounding it. They're all around it. The, the thing's right there. Right well, see, that's kind of the good thing, though. See, evil always gets judged. These guys make excuses. They're going to make excuses about scanning naked children, scanning naked women and men. They're going to make excuses about how it doesn't hurt you. They're the ones that are going to die first. Oh, yeah. Eight hours a day standing around it. And I'm sad for them, but this is what they want. This is what they get. Every year we make resolutions to lose weight and get in shape. And the truth is, it's hard, even with diet and exercise, because of toxic food and our environment that is stressing our bodies more than ever before. Working with experts in nutrition and biochemistry, I found that super high quality nutraceuticals, in addition to my diet and exercise, were the answers that synergistically worked. I can see the drastic changes every day with the amount of weight I've lost, my increased stamina, and more of a twinkle in my eye. That's why we are now so excited to launch the InfoWars Life Resolution Pack, combining three essential formulations, oxygen-based cleanser oxy powder, the secret 12 bioavailable vitamin B12, and your choice of super female or super male vitality. Now all available at a discounted price to you and your family to bring in the new year and make 2015 a true success. That's InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. 2015 is the year to do it, and it all starts at InfoWarsLife.com.
You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.